On Thanksgiving Day, 1897, an ode to Mill Mountain appeared in the Roanoke Times. It began with these words, Mill Mountain, I'll utter a song in thy praise. Thou mindest of hills in my fair early days. Their storms so impressed on the lens of my eye, I paint them today on the dome of the sky. Just as it did more than a century ago, the mountain has continued to be an inspiration for generations of visitors. When somebody says Mill Mountain, the first thing that comes to mind is the star and the zoo. The star! Everybody talks about the star. Roanoke star. Yep. The first thing that comes to my mind is the star. I grew up in Roanoke and remember that star from my childhood. The iconic location visitors should come. Activity. There's always uh, an excuse to get out and, and walk the mountain. And then the top of the mountain is the, the reward. For me, it's theater. I think it's because it's so ingrained with the entire reason that I came to Roanoke. The opportunities we have for outdoor activities, for hiking and biking and climbing and picnicking. The first thing that comes to my mind is this garden because we spend a lot of time up here. But I also think of it as an iconic symbol of our city. It, it truly is. Probably the first thing is the star because I think as we grew up in Roanoke that was the one thing that attracted you and when we would come home from trips we would have a fight between the three brothers of who got to see it first. When I hear the word Mill Mountain I think of what is the center of our city and not just the geographical center, we're one of the only cities that has a mountain within our boundaries, but I think of what it really is the center of our city's life, our history, our activities, and really our identity as the star city of the South. Unique, um, special. We're so fortunate to have an amenity like that that is right in our backyard. Not many people can, can boast about that, and um, I really think that that sets us apart and makes us unique here in Roanoke. Mill Mountain stands 800 feet above the city of Roanoke, with a total elevation of over 1,800 feet. It has been beckoning visitors since before there was a Roanoke. Back in the 1770s, Mark Evans settled at the base of Mill Mountain and established a mill operation. And when he died, the mill fell to his son, uh, Daniel Evans and ultimately to the McClanahan family. And so for about a century and a half, there had been a mill operation along the Roanoke River. And there is an interesting story. A, a very young George Washington, when he was a colonel, had been sent out into the Virginia frontier to, to scout the area for potential fortifications. And he actually stayed overnight with the Evans family. But yeah, it was a grist mill and operated for well over a century. And that's how Mill Mountain got its name. In 1882, the small town of Big Lick became Roanoke. The city grew so quickly that it earned the nickname of the Magic City. In its decennial year of 1892, a huge celebration took place to commemorate the city's 10th anniversary. It included a mock battle, complete with artillery on the flank of Mill Mountain. On the mountaintop, a hotel and observation tower would open. The mountain would have several owners over the years, most notably, the Roanoke Land and Improvement Company, entrepreneur William P. Henritzi, Washington and Lee University, businessman Junius B. Fishburne, and finally, the city of Roanoke. The mountain had been offered to the, the city for purchase, and the city had passed on it. They just did not have the financial wherewithal at the time. And so the Fishburne family purchased the mountain held it for several months and then ultimately donated it to the city of Roanoke to become, you know, kind of what it is today. The mountain was donated to the city by J.B. Fishburne and um, he's donated a handful of other parcels to the city for use as parks and, and then of course his home which is uh, now serves as a rec center. That's Mountain View. The uh, Fishburne Mansion sits on 13th Street over in southwest Roanoke. I think uh, one of the big draws of Mill Mountain is the accessibility. You know, the fact that we have this 600 acre natural resource right in the middle of town. And if you want to hike or you want to ride your bike or you just want to go to the Star, you can do it on your lunch break and you can get there pretty quick. And we're lucky to have it in Roanoke, right in the city. It's a wonderful thing to have, I think. Keeps a lot of green in the middle of us, which is good. 
Not a lot of cities have a mountain in their city limits, especially an urban center like ours. There are mountainous cities across the country, but to have one, uh, especially one that's protected and, and is a park, is, uh, is pretty unique. It is that beacon. It's a great visual when you're coming into Roanoke. So if you're flying to Philadelphia or Washington or New York, um, you know, you do have that loop where you head out go around the city, you go right past the star. So it's neat because when you're coming up from the south, it's usually the first thing that you see before you land in Roanoke. And then when you're heading east or north, it's the last thing you see when you leave. So it is that nice beacon welcoming you and then again saying goodbye. The mountain watches over day-to-day -day life in Roanoke and the valley. It's visible from many vantage points and has a storied history. Throughout the years, quite a few things have been built on the mountain, including overlooks and other ways to appreciate the view from the top. The first observation tower was in the early 1890s. That had been erected by the Roanoke Gas and Water Company, which actually was an early owner of Mill Mountain, with the idea that it was an observation tower. You could come up and look out across the, the Roanoke Valley and just take in the, the view. There was a, a park up here uh, with trails, walking trails and that kind of thing. Rock Ledge Inn was up here as a place for folks to, to visit, to eat, you know, to stay. And so there were some amenities up here. But again, the whole idea of the old carriage road that came up the mountain was to get folks to the top of the mountain as a, as a tourist attraction. And especially for those that were coming and staying at the Hotel Roanoke or other hotels in the downtown area to get them out of the, the city center and into the mountains and to be in, able to enjoy the kind of natural amenity that the mountain provided. In 1910, a new observatory was built near where the star is located today. According to Raymond Barnes' History of the City of Roanoke, it had a powerful searchlight that was said to be visible as far away as Buchanan on a clear dark night. On March 2, 1914, a northwest gale wrecked the tower. By May of the same year, a new 90-foot tower was built to welcome visitors. It met its end 22 years later in 1936. We lived in Northwest, and Daddy loved fires. And one night we looked out and he saw this big fire up on the mountain. He said, oh boy, look at that. We got to go see that. So he grabbed me up and he and I washed out there to see, see what we could see and climbed up Mill Mountain, went up the old road, got up there and there it was, just like a torch at the night. It was quite something, it was really scary. But it's a sight you never forget. It just was very impressive and very, very sad too because it was a wonderful lookout place. I had gone up it when it was in its, in its heyday. <laughs> it was a wonderful view from up there. Development grew on the flank and base of the mountain as well as the top. In 1892, a 20-acre park with a small man-made lake and walking paths was created around Crystal Spring. In 1903, Mountain Park opened in what is today South Roanoke. It included a dance pavilion, an 800-seat theater known as the Casino, and eventually a roller coaster. Ground was broken for a hospital in 1893. Due to funding difficulties, it wouldn't be completed until 1900. The medical legacy continues today at the foot of the mountain with Carillion Roanoke Memorial Hospital. Luring visitors to the top of the mountain to see scenery unsurpassed was the Mill Mountain Incline. It was advertised as being safe as the Bank of England and as strong as the Rock of Gibraltar. More than 1,500 passengers turned out to ride on opening day. Fare to ride was 25 cents equivalent to between six and seven dollars today. The incline was uh, an idea that was birthed by a group called the Century Club back in 1909. Edward Stone, who had stone printing, was uh, kind of the head of that organization. It was a businessman's group that saw as their mission to promote Roanoke and to promote the, the kind of economic and tourist well-being of, of uh, the city. And so they came up with the idea of doing an incline up the side of, of Mill Mountain. And it started out as a $15,000 project, and so they capitalized it. When it opened in 1910, it had cost $40,000. Edward Stone said right up front to all of the investors, he said, we're doing this out of patriotic sentiment. Nobody really expected to make much money off of it. It was a little cooler, had nice fresh breezes, and of course the Rock Ledge Inn was up there. It opened in 1892. 
But it was a hard trip to come up and even harder, people said, to get down safely. So the incline opened and all of a sudden you could make a trip up and down the mountain in four and a half minutes. So that really opened up the mountaintop for Roanoke's enjoyment. Rode the incline many times when I was little. Mother and daddy would take us up there, my brother and I, and we would go up there and have picnics on the mountain. That was wonderful. Ride up that incline, that was so much fun. The incline went up and down the mountain behind what is today's Carillion Roanoke Memorial Hospital. At the top of the mountain, remnants of the infrastructure remain. It could accommodate 60 passengers at a time. The track was one half mile long, with a grade from 29 to 58 percent. Operated by a 150 horsepower motor, there were two cars counterbalanced to pass each other at the halfway point, making it a funicular. The only time I've ever heard that word was from Europe. Never heard it used in Roanoke or in the United States, funicular. And you're going, what in the world was that? It was hard enough for me to understand that there was a cable operation and it was weighted so that when one car went up the other car came down and the cars and you look at the pictures of the cars I guess they had steps that you went up on and walked into each level of the cars because they were made in a stair step. The numbers are that in 1910 an average of 4400 riders per month used the incline. Two years later, by 1912, ridership had dropped to about 1,800 per month. And locals were kind of a, a one and done. You know, if you took the incline up once or twice, then you had kind of done it. And so even local interest began to wane. But it clearly put Roanoke on the map in the minds of some because we were the only uh, locality that had that kind of amenity in the state. And so while Stone and his investors didn't make a lot of money off the incline, it did in a way serve its purpose in that it helped to promote Roanoke. The incline closed in 1929. It had been kind of sold once or twice in the interim and then was scrapped in 1930. So the incline was short-lived. It was a really good idea, it created a lot of conversation, didn't make any money. As the city of Roanoke was celebrating its 10th anniversary, Rock Ledge Inn opened with much fanfare. A long procession of carriages took guests up the mountain and to the formal opening in May of 1892. Newspaper accounts say that the new hotel was well christened with a lot of speeches and an elegant lunch. Among the items served were lobster salad, Russian caviar, fruits, champagne, vanilla ice cream, and Havana cigars. A review of the two-story hotel proclaimed it to be an excellent place to spend the summer months. What a neat thing to be able to come up, get something to drink, sit out on the little porch, and look over the mountain. And it's interesting, a lot of the territory in Roanoke was not tree-covered then, so the view would have been totally different. You could have seen where the roads were being built and where the houses were being built, so it had to have a much different context of a view than what we would you know, see today. But apparently uh, it was a big deal to come and have a park-like setting and you had picnics and events for organizations and all that. After suffering a loss of business during an economic downturn, the inn deteriorated but was spruced up to welcome new business when the incline opened. In 1920, the incline, the inn, and the mountain were all acquired by William P. Henretzi. He had Rockledge Inn and it was a, an interesting place. It never really thrived um, because it was hard for people to get up here and just a little far out and wasn't quite so practical. But they did have a nice dinner and dinner dance business. And I've had to laugh because I've come across some of the old menus and their specialty was chicken and waffles. And I just thought that was so cute. Eventually the inn closed and years later the building would serve a new purpose bringing drama to the residents of Roanoke. Whether you're traveling the Blue Ridge Parkway or coming up from the city below via the J.B. Fishburn Parkway, Mill Mountain today is easily accessible. That wasn't always the case. A 1920 account describes a winding road up the mountain with cutting rocks and deep gulches. The roughness of the road, however, didn't slow everybody down. An Essex touring car raced approximately three miles up the 24 twists and turns of the mountain from South Jefferson Street to Rockledge Inn, setting a hill climbing record of six minutes, 52 seconds.
After the trip, three of the car's occupants solemnly swore never again to seek that particular thrill. 1924 saw vast improvements when the winding switchback toll road was opened by William P. Henritzi and his brother John. The road was made of concrete and cost an astonishing $90,000. It was pronounced to be an engineering marvel and the longest continuous stretch of concrete mountain highway in the world. It started out really as a carriage road back in the, again in the 1890s. It, it was a bit troublesome in that early, early descriptions of the carriage road said that it took two to three hours from the time you started at the base of the mountain or, or where the carriage road began until you actually got to the summit of Mill Mountain. So I'd have to say that for most folks, a three hour experience was probably a little bit more than what folks had, uh, had bargained for. Then it became much more developed and then became a toll road and, and we still have the old toll gate that, that's still there. It was made out of concrete and that was you know something that you didn't do a lot. A lot of streets in Roanoke were brick and then places like Woods Avenue became concrete and I guess obviously there were some others but you would have thought with all the changes in the topography that concrete on a, on a mountain where th things could have contraction and expansion would not have been the first choice. What was really unique about that road was the the loop to loop. You go under a bridge and then over the bridge immediately right there at the uh, what, what we call Rock Ledge now, the, the home that's that's there. But that served as uh, the primary access for several years up to the top of the mountain and people still use it today as, as part of the Mill Mountain Greenway. The beautiful walls that Mr. Henritzi built have suffered some root damage and freeze and thaw but you know it's still a central part of our city. People walk it every day and it's a big focus for charitable groups and charitable walks and of course now we have the Blue Ridge Marathon and this house is exactly the halfway mark on the marathon as they go under the loop the loop bridge. Speed was the name of the game in 1933 when another hill climb record was broken. This time by well-known racer Chet Miller. His one minute 38 second trip up the mountain in a Hudson Essex terraplane was timed by six stopwatches. The hill climb races were very popular as automobiles were evolving and becoming more efficient and faster and it was a big deal to have a hill climb race they were called in your city and in 1933 in April of 1933 there was a hill climb race here on Mill Mountain and everyone was up in the front yard here and running across the bridge watching these beautiful cars come up the road and as it would be the first car comes up makes the turn and crashes into our stone wall <laughs> so it's really it's really fun to watch it Years later, local drivers would still find the road to be a challenge. I remember going around those curves as a kid with my license, trying always to never go over the line that was done up the middle. And when I worked for the city, we painted that line when I was on the paint crew. But one of the more interesting things that, that I found out about my grandfather was a car company owner. He sold cars. And uh, he apparently, uh, with others, did timed driving up the mountain and that was a big deal. But you had a single car at a time, and uh, when I was a little boy, he had gotten a Mercedes 190 SL in to sell, and he decided to take me for a ride, and he took me up the mountain. I was scared to death, because I think he was playing out his boyhood dreams of doing the timed ridings again. I thought I was gonna die, but I made it. Located at the Loop de Loop on what was once the toll road, High up on the mountain, overlooking the valley, is the home known as Rock Ledge. Rock Ledge was built in 1929 by William P. Henritzi, and he was quite the entrepreneur. He owned some orchards, some real estate downtown, including the Roanoke Theater. And according to his sister Ruby, who was interviewed when she was 102, Will fell in love with the mountain, so he bought it. And that's how he came to own Mill Mountain and build the house up here. It is truly built on a rock ledge if you look out in the clearing that we've tried to maintain. And also, as the Depression hit Roanoke in the 1930s, Mr. Henritzi lost the mountain and he only kept the house and one acre. But if you look out, our acre is actually an artificial 
front yard. It's built as a flower box, a big concrete flower box, and it's all terraced with lovely paths and little gardens down there. And some of the early construction pictures just show what a visionary he was to think that he could put this road and a home up here because there, there really was no flat area. Lovingly restored by the dyes, the house still has many of its original features. The woodwork that Mr. Henritzi designed for this house is beautiful, and according to his daughters, he did design everything in the house, including just the basic floor plan. The wood is a variety of woods. The formal rooms are mostly walnut with very intricate crown molding, and then the more casual rooms, such as the library and the front parlor, are Mississippi gum, and that's a very distinctive light-colored wood with a lot of beautiful movement in it. And then the floors also have a lot of inlays with rosewood and ebony. It's a very, it's a very 1920s house. Members of the Henritzi family lived in Rockledge until it was sold in the late 1980s. It changed hands two times more, becoming the home of former Roanoke Mayor Ralph Smith for a time, and then the Dyes in 2005. It's been really interesting living here, not just because of it's Rockledge and it's such a beautiful home and we love to entertain and welcome people into it, but in investigating the history of the mountain and the house, I've learned so much about Roanoke's history. For example, we have a blueprint of the landscape plan for this home and it's absolutely lovely. And long story short, the landscape architect was a man named A.A. A. Farnham and he started the landscape architecture department at Virginia Tech did the design at the Hotel Roanoke, worked in Boston and Lynchburg, and there are many homes here in Roanoke that he helped design and do their landscape as well. So Roanoke has, it, it has a treasure of history that sometimes goes untapped and unappreciated. One interesting tidbit that Nancy's uncovered was Mr. Henritzi's fascination with one of our nation's founding fathers. This is amazing to me. Evidently, Mr. Henritzi was a great admirer of our first president, George Washington. And in fact, we've been very fortunate to be able to return to Rockledge two portraits, one of George and one of Martha. We really love them and we're glad to have them back here. Wanting to share his admiration of Washington, Mr. Henritzi contacted sculptor and artist Gutsam Borglum, who created Mount Rushmore during the 20s and 30s. Mr. Henritzi got the idea that it would be very exciting to have a bust of George Washington on Mill Mountain. So we have been so fortunate to come into original correspondence between these two men, and he actually came and stayed here and evaluated the mountain for its suitability and he decided that because the stone was too crumbly, it was not granite like Mount Rushmore, that the mountain was better suited for paths and meandering pathways with nice little areas to rest, maybe some little waterfalls, and just um, capitalize on the natural beauty of the mountain. But Mr. Henritzi, not being one to take no for an answer, replied back that, well, if my stone isn't suitable, why don't you just ship me a big slab of granite and I'll find a way to get it to the mountaintop for you to carve it. And that was about 1933 when the depression hit Roanoke and that was kind of the end of that project for him. In addition to Rockledge, Mr. Henritzi built other houses on the face of Mill Mountain, including Terra Alta. He had elaborate ideas for the top of the mountain as well. We recently were fortunate enough to come into a set of beautifully rendered blueprints that were drawn, again, that same era, 1932-33, and it was to build a beautiful inn up on Mill Mountain, and he was way ahead of his time. Many, many bedrooms, all with closets, all with bathrooms, some connecting as suites for families to vacation together on Mill Mountain. And we'd heard that he was quite the collector, traveled extensively and accumulated a wealth of antiques from a project called Bolt Castle that was never completed in New York. And now we understand he had envisioned on these blueprints an Italian wing, an English wing, a Spanish, a French wing, a music room. And he had planned to outfit his 
new rock ledge in with these beautiful pieces of antiques and artwork that he had accumulated. But again, another dream that the depression crashed. I would love to be able to have dinner with William Henritzi. I have a million questions for him. He was someone who was a force of nature. He didn't take no for an answer. And we've heard some funny stories about him after they built the road and the toll booth that he would want to charge them to come up to read his water meter. And they didn't want to pay the toll. And then they got in a fight that they were going to turn his water off. So I'm not sure who actually won that one. But Kevin and I are so blessed to be here. And we absolutely love this home and the people that we've met. And we always say that Rockledge has enriched our lives and that we are simply the stewards of Mr. Henritzi's home for this generation and hope that we can pass it on and it'll be a part of the community in the future. So the Renwick Star is above all something that you've never seen before. As someone once put it, it's our icon. It's what draws people here. If you go somewhere where there might be the, it's the Eiffel Tower, well, it's our Eiffel Tower. Oftentimes, uh, over the years, you've heard pilots who are flying in who look for the star as a way to develop their flight pattern um, into the region. It's a great beacon home that you can see sometimes up to 60 miles away. It says a lot about what they originally thought of was, was something temporary to become something more permanent. I think it's the perfect representation for how we want to present our city to the outsiders. And I love, I love when people say, I always know I'm home when I see the star. I think that's just such a special thing. It was put up as a Christmas decoration in 1949. When it was lit, we went from being the magic city to the star city. So uh, ever since then, the star has been a symbol of, of the city of Roanoke. There was uh, an organization called the uh, Roanoke Merchants Association, and which was downtown retailers primarily. They had a Christmas decoration committee and it was exactly as the name implied. And so this group every year would do things to promote uh, Christmas shopping in downtown Roanoke. And they did all the usual kinds of things of lights and, and decorations uh, along the sidewalks and on the, on the lamp post in downtown Roanoke and had live models in retail windows, you know, displaying the, the latest fashions and all of that kind of thing. And, by the time we get to the late 40s, the committee was really wanting something big time. Uh, how could they not only promote Christmas shopping to Roanokers, but to the wider region, drawing people from Lynchburg, Lexington, the New River Valley area, and even beyond. And so they solicited ideas, and a number of things came forward. Uh, one was to take strands of lights and develop a huge Christmas tree on the face of Mill Mountain. Another one was to elect a big lighted cross on one of the buildings in downtown Roanoke. And, and so while they were moving in the right direction, nothing really was working until Roy Kinsey of Kinsey Sign Company suggested a star, a lighted star, on the, the summit of Mill Mountain. From downtown, you don't think it's as big as it is. That was a clue that we had to furnish when we built the stars to how big it needed to be. I think we put something up there about 25 or 30 feet tall just to see what something looked like and you could tell it, you couldn't tell what it was. In the sign business, we'd sell a customer a sign and we'd be putting it together in the plant. Customers would come by and look at it and they'd say, my Lord, it's big. But when you put it up out on the lot, <laughs> it fits. Kinsey Sign Company was a family affair. Bob was 24 when his father Roy and two older brothers created the star. The project was to be done quickly and the weather wasn't always cooperative. Working through rain, sleet, and wind, the star went up. It is 88 and a half feet tall, mounted on a 60,000 pound, 100 foot steel frame. In addition to the big star, small stars were commissioned for the streets of downtown. A lot of work. <laughs> Had to be done in kind of a short period of time. We didn't have a lot of time to work. Late August, we got the job. We had to have it done. Uh, Thanksgiving Eve, 
and that was to build the one on the mountain and a hundred small ones and install them all downtown. It was up to us to engineer it, then put it all together. After we designed it and the size of it, we could determine the wind loading of what we were going to install on the steel framework. The steel framework was furnished by the Royal Iron and Bridge Works. Uh, Mr. Bob Little was their mechanical engineer and we gave him the specification. And we wanted it designed to withstand a 100 mile an hour wind with a 30% safety factor. They didn't want to bring all the framing up to the top of the mountain and then realize it didn't all fit together. So they actually laid out the framing for the star on the tarmac at Woodrum Field first. Once they realized all pieces fit together, it was going to function as it should and be erected as it should, then they brought it piece by piece up to Mill Mountain and erected the framing for the star. The frame was placed on a base consisting of 500,000 pounds of concrete, and grounding was engineered from cables that came from Roanoke's retired streetcars. To illuminate the star, 2,000 feet of neon tubing was needed. It was up to us to fabricate the three stars and assemble them in units where we could lift them up and attach them to the steel framework. And in the meantime, we had, had to manufacture all the neon for it. For the big star, it was rather simple. It's all straight tubes. With the hundred small stars downtown, each star had two neon tubes on it, one on each side, but a single neon tube formed the entire star. So it had to be fabricated. It took a lot of work to do all of that. So all of this buildup had been to the lighting of the star. It had sleeted, it had snowed, it had rained all week, and so there was this real concern that, that it wasn't going to be pulled off on Thanksgiving Eve. But the weather cleared, it was able to go forward at 8 o'clock on that night, and a number of speakers spoke. Mayor A.R. Minton threw the ceremonial switch. Bob Kinsey threw the actual switch that lit the star. They came to me that afternoon warning the control switch remote down where the speakers would be. It was all wired with a special time clock to control it, and it was to turn it on. I debated, I said, I, I gotta take that all or loose and re-rig this thing to, so he can do it. And I just gave him a little switch for the cord that disappeared in the bushes. <laughs> but it didn't connect to anything. <laughs> and I flipped it on. It was a good thing I did. To turn it on, you had a big, heavy contactor. Big old magnetic thing that slammed shut. That energized the main power to the breaker panel. The breaker panel then had all the little circuits to the, so you could turn on either white or red or both at that time. That contactor, sometimes when you turned it on, it would chatter. And lo and behold, when I turned it on the first time, it chattered. And I just immediately cut it off and back on. And the second time, it, it stayed. So that's why it blinked. And it's mentioned in the write-up that it came on, went off, and right back on. So if he had done it and that thing chattered, he wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> When Mayor Mitten lit the star ceremonially, he was the one that said, we are now the star city of the South. And so that phrase then stuck as, um, as a result. The ceremony on November 23rd, 1949 began at 8 p.m. About 250 dignitaries and invited guests were in attendance, including actor John Payne. The star's lighting made news across the country. Decades later, the star is still shining across the valley. It's old school neon, uh, so you put in the, the gas into the specific tubes uh, for those, and that's the color that, that lights up. Red and white. It, each of the three stars has one red tube and two white tubes. The red being the real predominant neon. It's true neon. 
the white is actually argon and the white powder coating to give it color and, and brilliance. But the white will fade. The neon is as bright and as red as it ever will be, always, doesn't matter whether it's hot or cold, it's red. The white depends on a little, little dab of mercury to warm up. Blue tubes were added to the smallest star in the mid-70s so that the star could be lit in red, white, and blue to celebrate the nation's bicentennial. Over the years, it's been lit in various colors for different occasions. It would glow red when a traffic fatality occurred in Roanoke. Among other times it was shown red was after the assassination of John F. Kennedy and after the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger. After the terrorist attacks on 9-11, the star would shine red, white, and blue for almost a decade. Red, white, and blue. Those are the only colors that we can do. More often than not, it stays all white. And um, our typical practice has been on certain holidays like July 4th or Memorial Day. Those that, um, you know, ever since the events of September 11th, anything that evokes patriotism will light the star red, white, and blue. A star for our country. What a great symbol, what a Betsy Ross symbol. I know that the, the star was chosen because it is a symmetrical and um, the way that they built the star, it was inside each other. So they were able to make this really, really work. So I, it's home and I know I'm home when I see the star. We built it to stay up there, even if it was just for a few months. And in doing so, it's still there. The star was actually meant to be temporary. It was meant to go up, and then after the Christmas season was over with, it would in all likelihood be dismantled and be kind of a one-time thing. And of course, people fell in love uh, with, the, with the star, and it has remained there ever since. It's amazing that since 1949, we've maintained it. We've looked at it as, as a part of our region. It is um, untouchable. The star being a beacon uh, is very important for general aviation if they're flying on visual flight rules. You know, on a clear night, they can see it from about 40 miles away. So it lets them know they're getting close and those city lights below that star uh, is Roanoke. And uh, so that's been a good wayfinding measure for it. Back even before we went to full on instrument flight flying, the city market building used to have Roanoke marked on it so people would know. So you'd have the combination of Mill Mountain, the visual of the star, and then the sign on top of the market building, uh, and pilots would know they were uh, going in the right direction to land in Roanoke. The star played a special role in Bob Kinsey's life on Christmas Eve, 1949. <laughs> Well, at that point, you could still drive in underneath the star. And we drove up and parked underneath the star, and I made a little proposal. <laughs> Best thing I ever did in my life. We talked about, you know, I said, well, we could get married in June. Most of the brides were June brides. I said, oh, why don't we, we'll just go ahead and get married in March. We kept moving it back, so. And what did his future bride think of the star? Well, I thought he did a pretty good job. <laughs> and, and he built it just for me so he could propose to me <laughs> under it. <laughs> Today, the star and the star cam that's perched on it bear witness to the passing of time and the visitors who stop by. The summit of the mountain continues to be a draw for proposals, weddings, and more. We're from Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm originally from Roanoke, so we're back up here for the memories and the fall, the mountains. It's just beautiful. We love it up here. I'm originally from New York City. And I, I was living in Miami before here. We just got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah <laughs> that brought us to the mountain. <laughs> I mean, what's more iconic than the star? We actually, one of the first places we went to on our, when we first started dating was here as well, so it felt right. <laughs> a community-wide project brought a new attraction to the mountaintop in 1952, the Children's Zoo. On July 4th, it opened to the public, and at that point it was managed by the city of Roanoke and opened as a storybook zoo for children. In the 70s, early 70s, um, the operation went from the city to the JCs, 
of Roanoke, and then from there it uh, transferred into a, a private, not-for-profit Blue Ridge Zoological Society. The idea behind the original zoo theme was to provide a place for youngsters where they could get acquainted with animals in a colorful setting, featuring Mother Goose and other familiar stories. Sites included the Superintendent's Castle, Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, Willie the Blue Whale, Billy Goat's Gruff, and Noah's Ark. And of course, there were the animals. So they would have seen pigs and, and bear and um, assorted barn animals and um, some maybe more exotic animals, but mainly they were pretty tame on the exotic animal scale. <laughs> Back in those days, the city owned both the zoo and the transportation museum. And the city did a wonderful job of creating, along with the civitants, this nursery rhyme theme for the zoo. And every child wanted to go there because we were so familiar with nursery rhymes. It was just a thrill to come in the front door through the shoe and then go to the whale or go to the monkey house or, you know, go to the three little pigs. I mean, it was like going to our Disneyland, which was really special. And then you got to ride the train and look at the view. And to think that a bunch of men in the Civitan Club came up with a concept that the city could buy and participate in is really great. It shows a lot about what the Roanoke was at the time. Changes to the theme of the zoo came in the 90s. So they began to um, explore more the oriental theme and our relationship with Korea and our sister city and so they began working on a concept um, mountains of the Orient and the collection really began shifting to Asian themed collection and mixed in there we still had North American species as well such as Wolverine, Red Wolf and Cougar and today it's retained a collection that's predominantly either Asian or North American. The zoo has had many well-known residents. The ones that I have heard people be most familiar with would be Bo, our Wolverine, who had served as an ambassador animal with Jack Hanna for a number of years. Also Oops, the Japanese macaque, who uh, made her famous escape <laughs> long before I got here. Oops was on the run while we were doing our renovations, and the workmen would leave food around and things like that. Our alarm would go off all the time at night, and we think we thought that maybe it was Oops trying to get into Rockledge, but I don't know. Uh, Nina, the cougar, who was another animal that came to us through the Columbus Zoo and had been a longtime resident, and then, of course, most famously, Ruby the tiger, who still pulls on the heartstrings of the community. She was young when she came, so originally she was housed in the um, structure that's closest to our main entrance. And of course, as she grew, she needed a new home. And so where our red wolves and where our cougar previously um, was housed, that entire space was dedicated to uh, Ruby. The zoo continues to change and adapt with a focus on outreach, education, and conservation. Mill Mountain Zoo has been affiliated with the Red Wolf um, Species Recovery Program since uh, the early 90s, really. We have a passion for them. They are America's only um, native wolf species. Unfortunately, the hunting pressures and just human habitation pressures that were put on them drove them to literally the brink of extinction. Here at the zoo, now we have um, some bald eagles, one of which is well known to her fan base <laughs> um, out of Missouri, named Elsie. Uh, we have some small clawed otters here, and we've added some new ones like our raccoons, um, Ivan and Katya, to our collection. So we're shifting our collection a little bit towards a more Appalachian or regional focused collection so that we can just kind of showcase some of those animals that people think they know, but maybe don't really know. We want people to come up to the mountain, enjoy our beautiful scenery, and we also want them to leave with an appreciation of animals that not only would they find in their backyard,
but that people across the globe were finding in their backyards. And we all need to try to understand how we're gonna live with those animals as the pressures increase on both of us. So we just try to share the message of our ambassadors with our guests and hope that they leave here having a nice time and a little more knowledge. Another longtime Roanoke favorite, Mill Mountain Theater, got its start on the mountaintop. For a time, the theater breathed new life into what had been the old Rock Ledge Inn. It was a wooden structure. It was um, had a lot of character to it, and it um, had been abandoned for a little bit. Um, but then Mill Mountain uh, Playhouse came in and, and took over and actually started the theater. Mill Mountain actually Playhouse back then um, started in 1964 with uh, a group of friends who were directors and producers and actors out of New York that wanted a place that they could do theater with their friends. Um, so that was the beginning of a wonderful thing and it was actually one of the, the chair of the department at Holland University or Holland College back then, um, Jim Ayers and this group of men um, started Mill Mountain Playhouse um, up on the mountain in 1964. It was fabulous. How they got a, a stage and seating in there, I don't know. That, that was a miracle in and of itself. But when you had a matinee, everybody went outside and they had lemonade and of course it was dark usually by then and you could look over the mountain and see everything. It was just a very special place to come to a play. It was a lot of that summer stock fair, so light, happy, romantic comedies, musicals, nothing really hard or heavy, because um, again, they wanted to do something that was fun for the community, but also fun for themselves to do with their friends and have a reason to come back to the Roanoke Valley in the summertime. Um, so a, a very light, kind of mainstream fair. On October 15th, 1976, tragedy struck. This phrase, it always, it, it makes me think because it's uh, such an oxymoron, but the way it was explained to me and what we've read in the, the archival newspapers, it was an accidental arson. So you can think about that phrase for a moment. Um, so in other words, like somebody might have flicked a cigarette butt and it smoldered and because it was a very old wooden structure, it went up in flames. And I'll never forget, I was president of the JCs and we looked up on the mountain the day it caught on fire and they couldn't get enough water to it. It was just terrible to watch uh, from downtown. And there's stories um, from our board members that were serving at the time that they could see, like even down at the towers area, they could see the plumes of smoke and they knew the playhouse is on fire. And there was, there was nothing they could do. Even with all the fire trucks and everybody actively working, it happened so fast with that old dried wood, it apparently went down in about three hours. From 64 to 76, they grew tremendously. So much so that once the, the fire did happen, it was a scramble to find a new home for the theater um, because they knew it was worth salvaging. Attendance was well received. Um, apparently there was um, great memories of the lemonade that was served up there. Um, so I think that it, it grew quickly as far as its patronage and folks that really loved having that venue and that type of entertainment right here in the valley. After the fire, they landed in another historic location, the Grandin Theater, where they stayed for eight years before moving to their current home at Center in the Square in 1983. Established in 1927, the signature project of the award-winning Mill Mountain Garden Club is the wildflower garden on top of the mountain. So back in the early 70s, the city reached out to the garden club and asked them to plan and develop a wildflower garden on about an acre and a half. And uh, the Wildflower Garden Club has been maintaining that space faithfully since uh, 1975. And that is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, partnerships that our department has with a nonprofit organization. And they are a wonderful group of people to work with. I've been a member of the club for probably 35 or 40 years. I've been a member for 25 years. About 30 years. Oh, goodness. 12 years? <laughs> and I'm just very enthusiastic about all aspects of our club. And. Um, it has gone by so quickly, as, as all fun activities do. The city of Roanoke had a Mill Mountain Development Committee that said, Mountain needs a garden. And the city came to us and said, would you do it? And we, with a lot of confidence and bravado, said, yes, sure. 
So we worked with the city. We tagged the trees that we wanted to save. The city cleared it. And then it, after that, we planted, to begin with, 36 indigenous trees and wildflowers and understory bushes and rhododendron and azalea. One of our goals, which is to establish native plants from the tiniest little wildflower to the greatest oak. We have it up here for the community. It's for all of the community, no matter what your age is. And it's just uh, a garden of delight. And it's also a outdoor classroom. And so we're a, a conservation environmental oasis up here. That's the way we feel. <laughs> The Discovery Center is a great partner of ours and they um, have lots of classes up here and little field trips during the summer in their summer camps. Through that partnership we get to see all the activities and all the children and this is their nature lab. When they are studying trees or birds or plants. As the years have progressed people have become more interested in the outdoors. Um, visitors from other parts of the country whom you meet up here. One week this summer when we were working up here, a lady walked by and she said, what are you doing? And we said, we're weeding, we're in the garden club. And she said, can I help you? And we said, well, of course. And so she weeded for like an hour with us. And then she said, can I come back next week? And she came back for like three weeks every Thursday. I mean, we love having people come up and help and. Um, we welcome anyone who'd like to come weed. <laughs> there are lots of them. We're so proud of this project because it, we've sustained it for all these years. That's remarkable in our minds and also it, it embodies all the mission and goals of our club, which are beautification, horticulture, conservation, preservation, and education. <laughs> when we come up here, we get to know each other in a very deep way. And and friendships are established, we support each other, we learn, and the fact that it's lasted since the early 70s tells you something. Walking through the, uh, the trail and seeing the remnants of a wedding or seeing the remnants of a nature walk where a child has claimed a tree and he's learning that it's a, a white oak and he's gonna watch it through the progression of a year. I mean, there's always a treasure to find, even on a rainy day or a foggy day. There's something magical about this place. At the entrance, the Garden Club has created a pollinator garden to draw bees, butterflies, and other visitors, including people. The club is also working to remove invasives and add more native plants. Teaming up with the American Chestnut Foundation, one species they are working to help reestablish is the American Chestnut. Throughout it all, partnerships are important. One of our recent partnerships, you may have noticed the, the tree signage was with the Girl Scout troop. So that's a perfect example of how they volunteered their time. So they picked out 17 big and beautiful trees, native trees, and those girls got out, got their dads and got their specs and got their information and installed those signs. And that, that was a great volunteer service as an example. I just think that we are a very fortunate community to have such a spot within our city and to have people within the city who care about keeping something sacred. And this is a sacred spot. Over the years, there have been a lot of suggestions and plans for Mill Mountain that did not come to fruition. Just one example is a 1965 plan submitted by Stanley Abbott, which called for moving the star to Reed Mountain. It also proposed a ski slope, a hotel, restaurant, and theater, as well as parking for a thousand cars on the slopes of the mountain with a tramway to the summit. Among the things that did come to pass was a connector to the Blue Ridge Parkway in the mid-1960s. Accessibility to the mountain continued to improve a few years later, when the J.B. Fishburne Parkway opened in 1971 for those driving up from Roanoke. And the new century saw the construction of the award-winning Discovery Center. Discovery Center was built in 2001, and it serves primarily as an environmental education center and a visitor center for, for those uh, coming in off the parkway. We offer hundreds of environmental education programs for children and adults annually. It's a, it's a real asset to have on the mountain. 
Mule Mountain is one of over 70 parks the city of Roanoke manages. Protected under a conservation easement, Mill Mountain will continue to be a public park and recreation space in perpetuity. We have uh, 12 natural surface trails up there that total just under 10 miles and uh, they range in, in ability from beginner to, to advanced. They're mostly rocky and, and shale so they drain really easy so on a morning like this morning where it was pouring rain this afternoon when the sun's out you can get out and, and ride your bike and, and really not have any impact on the trail system at all. And then additionally, the, the old road serves as Mill Mountain Greenway. It uh, starts at Wells Fargo Plaza uh, downtown and terminates at the Star. Uh, it runs a little more than three miles. Whether it's the trails, the Star and Overlooks, the zoo or the wildflower garden, the mountain continually draws visitors from the Roanoke Valley and the Blue Ridge Parkway. Roanoke is the most populous jurisdiction along the Blue Ridge Parkway and Roanoke is also the cultural and recreational hub of Southwest Virginia. So I think having that, that connector road, that's an economic generator for, for the region, especially as we continue to brand ourselves as an outdoor destination. I think the accessibility of Mill Mountain has transformed our way of getting people to this region. It, you know, you need to have that accessibility. The incline was great, um, and I think that was the start. Um, then when the cars came to being, that was the next step. And now it's uh, a way that people walk, they bike, they come from all different areas, whether it's off the parkway, they're bringing family up here, they're getting married up here. I think that seeing this mountain in the state that it is from where you see it 60 miles away, from where you see it two miles away, from a drone experience to a mountain bike experience to the Blue Ridge Marathon, it really does say that the outdoor recreation is in fact the most important part of what this region has to offer. There is so much to be said about the iconic aspects of this mountain, whether it be international groups or local groups or residents bringing up friends and family. We know that from a tourism perspective, it's about word of mouth and it's about showcasing our region and being proud of where we live. Beginning a century and a quarter ago, Mill Mountain was and has always remained a centerpiece of promoting the Roanoke Valley. From the incline, the observation towers, Rock Ledge Inn, the Overlook, the Roanoke Star, Mill Mountain has always occupied that very unique role of being used to promote our city and our valley. Mill Mountain has always occupied that very special place and it is still doing that mission today. That's pretty remarkable.